What are the reasons justifying distinctions between armed conflicts? We know what are the main categories of armed conflict. We know why these categories are so important. Let's now turn to my last question. What are the reasons justifying these categories and their asymmetric regulations? The distinction between international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict may seem anachronistic. Many contemporary conflicts contain both an international and a non-international dimension. Moreover, as we shall see, the classification of hostilities is often controversial and can open the door to abuse. Despite these difficulties, there are two main reasons why these distinctions persist. The first one is historical and rather theoretical. The second is functional and of a more pragmatic nature. Let's start with the historical reason. For centuries, sovereign states have regulated their relationships in both peace and war through international law. This tradition is based on mutual recognition of national sovereignty and international legal personality of states. Conversely, governments have long been reluctant to subject their relations with dissidents or rebels to the rules of international law or to accept that such armed groups should benefit from any international status. Indeed, historically, states have considered that the regulation of any conflict occurring within their territories was primarily a matter of domestic criminal law. This is, for instance, the main reason why treaties governing non-international armed conflict contain very few obligations regulating the conduct of hostilities. Indeed, when adopting Common Article 3 to the Geneva Conventions and Additional Protocol 2, states wanted to retain as much freedom as was possible to fight dissidents or rebels. The granting of prisoner of war status, referred to here as POW status, also illustrates why states are still reluctant to accept the application of IHL to non-international armed conflicts. Belligerents involved in international armed conflicts are, under certain conditions, entitled to POW status when they fall into the hands of the enemy. Once combatants have POW status, they can benefit from the full protection of the Geneva Convention Treaty. Amongst other things, this means that captured combatants cannot be sanctioned for the fact that they have taken up arms against the adversary. Belonging to state armed forces, they have a right to do so. Of course, no state would accept conferring such immunities to individuals who participate in rebel movement. Let me briefly open a parenthesis here to emphasize that this historical ground must be re-evaluated in certain armed conflict in light of the contemporary human rights law and its application to armed conflicts. Human rights law imposes much stricter obligation upon states regarding, for example, the use of force or detention of individuals than IHL. In this context, certain states are increasingly inclined to apply the less stringent rules of IHL in these domains and for that purpose to consider that a given situation should be qualified as an armed conflict in order to circumvent or attenuate the consequences of the application of human rights laws. Thus, for these states, historical consideration of state sovereignty play a less significant role. Let's now close this parenthesis. On a more pragmatic level, we should always bear in mind that the different categories of armed conflict are also grounded on the nature of the actors who are participating in these conflicts. As we said earlier, in contrast to international armed conflicts, where states are the main belligerents, non-international armed conflicts also involve non-state actors. With the rare exceptions of failed or fragile states, states can rely on very developed and lasting national institutions, such as the judiciary, to implement the detailed IHL rules that apply in international armed conflicts. Apart from a few sophisticated non-international actors, like, for instance, Hezbollah in Lebanon, armed groups operating in non-international armed conflicts 
are usually structured in such a way that they can only apply minimal IHL rules, such as the one contained in Common Article 3 to the Geneva Conventions for low-intensity non-international armed conflict or in Additional Protocol 2 for high-intensity non-international armed conflicts. In other words, due to their intrinsic weaknesses, these groups would rarely be capable of respecting the extremely detailed rules contained in the four Geneva Conventions and in Additional Protocol 1. Moreover, when studying the protection of individuals in armed conflict, we will see that the Geneva Conventions classify protected persons according to two main categories – combatants and POWs on the one hand and civilians on the other. These categories make perfect sense in the context of international armed conflicts where they are clearly marked on the ground. However, in non-international armed conflicts, where the dividing line between armed forces and civilians is often tenuous, the notion of protected persons might be difficult to apply in practice. That explains why not such a clear-cut categories of protected persons exist in these conflicts.